So good morning and welcome to this new Europa webinar. Today, we will be looking at how to balance safety and ecology when we are dealing with uh, dying or already dead trees, especially those that are standing or, or partially standing, which can present a hazard if they just fall uh, suddenly, particularly when they are located close to trails, recreational areas, infrastructure, or houses, like you see in, in, in this picture. On the other hand, uh, in recent years, there has been a growing understanding of the vital function that dead trees serve in supporting biodiversity and regenerating uh, the forest. So managers of uh, peri-urban parks are confronted with the decision of leaving dying trees as they are, just standing for their ecological uh, benefits, uh, or cutting them down to prevent potentially uh, da uh, dangerous situations. So the question is, how much risk are they ready to assume for the benefit of ecology? So my name is, is Teresa Pastor, and I'll be guiding this webinar. I am the coordinator of the Europe Park uh, Periurban Parks Commission, which is one of the, the one offering you this webinar today. But uh, let me introduce first uh, the Europe Park Federation for those who still don't know uh, us yet which I hope uh, are very few by now. So uh, we are the largest and oldest uh, network of protected areas in Europe. We have around 400 members from around 40 countries, and we celebrated uh, last year our 50th anniversary. But more than a network of protected areas, what we really are, is a truly network of people. And this is what we enjoy doing, connecting people and nature across borders through conferences, seminars, online courses, or webinars uh, like this one. We also represent uh, our members' interests to political institutions. We further support them with activities that are close to their needs uh, through specific programs and commissions that work in agreed agendas. So one of such commission is the Peri-Urban Parks Commission uh, that focus on, on these crucial natural parks that, that are uh, located close uh, to our cities and that contribute so much to our well-being. Peri-Urban Parks deliver uh, many ecosystem services to the city and particularly, and they offer recreation, education and outdoor sport opportunities in a healthy natural environment to citizens. And that does the potential risk that dead trees and dying trees um, uh, have uh, can be can be uh, um, dangerous. If you want to know more about peri parks, or if you are interested in our commission, just check just check our website for further information. As we like to say, um, peri parks are the heart, soul, and lungs of the city. And moving to what we are here for today. I would like to go over some basic rules before starting. So as you already know, this webinar is being recorded. So uh, you can start or stop your video camera at your convenience, but we warmly invite you to keep the camera open. We think that it makes the digital environment a bit more warmer, but of course it is up to you. We would also uh, invite you to, uh, to make sure that your name is accurate. So if it is not, just uh, go to the participant list uh, find yourself and click in the three dots uh, next to your name or to your phone number that appears there, and then rename yourself. All presentations and, uh, and, and the recording of this webinar will be available in our website, and you will also receive it uh, by email, probably by the end of this week. If time allows, we might open microphones at the end of the session for discussion. In the meanwhile, uh, uh, I welcome you to, to make any comments and pose uh, questions to our speakers uh, directly in the, in the chat box. Uh, there will be uh, Q&A sessions after each uh, of the presentations. For now, uh, I invite you also to, to introduce yourselves and uh, just saying where you come from and the institution you, you work for so that we get to know each other a bit uh, better. And with no further ado, I would like to make a start by introducing our speakers. 
we'll first hear uh, uh, Andrei Verlix. Andrei has a PhD in environmental protection. He's currently a nature conservation counselor at the Landscape Park, Tivoli, Rosnik, and Siska here in Ljubljana. He worked for many years as a research assistant at the Slovenian Forestry Institute, where he mostly focused on urban forestry and recreation in forest in and around urban areas. In fact, I know him from those times. We met at a NEFU meeting at the European Forum of Urban Forests years ago. And Andre belongs to the European Urban Parks Commission. We will also have uh, Pablo Navasquez Ramos. He's a forest engineer and works as a forest manager uh, in Barcelona Natural Park in Barcelona, where I also sit. As Barcelona currently holds uh, one of the Europax offices. So Pablo has over 25 years of experience in forest management, restoration, and renaturalization. He has also expertise in forest fire prevention, silviculture, and management of the um, wildland and urban uh, interface areas. So now I am delighted uh, to pass the floor to Andre Verlik, who will present on talking terms with dead and dying trees. So Andre, uh, the floor is yours. Good morning. Thank you, Teresa, for the introduction. Uh, good morning also uh, to our audience. Um, let me just share the screen now. Does it work? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Let me just check now. If... Okay. Perfect. I think this will go smoothly now. So I come from Ljubljana, uh, where we have this really prestigious part of nature. Um, actually in the city center itself, uh, or just on the outskirts of the old city. You can see it uh, in this first slide. Uh, we are celebrating 40th anniversary uh, of this park as a nature protected area this year. Uh, the park is, um, let's say, composed mostly from forest, about 70%, and uh, uh, the, no, the most known uh, municipal city park, Tivoli. The whole park uh, is big, about 459 hectares, and it's bigger than, let's say, Central Park and Hyde Park together. Um, it's an integral part of the city for a long time. And for this, I just uh, made a review uh, of, um, uh, let's say, a little bit of history from the 19th century. I will go briefly through this, uh, that you will see that the city and the owners of this forest uh, paid uh, really special attention to this uh, integral part of the city. Uh, already in 1888, the forestry commissioner of then provincial government uh, created a detailed forest management plan uh, where he stated that the character of the forest park should remain preserved. Actually, uh, all these um, foresters are talking about a part of this park, 30 hectares of this park, which is just on the edge of the city park Tivoli, that later uh, became a greater area. Um, and I found that uh, this information that let's say in uh, 1,900, uh, the city of Ljubljana had uh, 30, a little more than 36,000 inhabitants. Today, it has th uh, 300,000 inhabitants, plus all the people that come uh, daily for work or to study or to shop, and of course, tourists. Um, Later on, uh, all the foresters uh, kind of a stick to this plan that this has uh, some kind of um, the, the, the most important part uh, or the role of this forest is uh, for health and recreation of the citizens. But for this, of course, it has to be managed. But already then, 
uh, foresters uh, kind of raise the tension to what um, what kind of environmental impact can overuse of the forest have. And for that case, for example, uh, some of those um, foresters suggested, let's say that chestnut trees in the forest should be cut down because people damage young trees when picking chestnut. And also that, for example, uh, some of the unjustifiably created uh, trails by pedestrians should be abandoned, closed, or dug up. Just, um, just to show you that quite for a long time, uh, um, this forest received a special attention. And maybe uh, the last one, uh, just let's say uh, after the Second World War, um, the, um, there was an interesting saying that the population should be asked to comply with the regulations and help preserve the forest park, a valuable public asset, and that young people should be taught to understand nature conservation in school. So it's not just these 40 years that this has been a nature protected area. Uh, this forest has been protected in this or another way for quite a long time. And due to this, uh, now we have a very biodiversity rich um, part of nature in the city. We have more than uh, 3000 uh, different species of organisms that were evidenced to live here, many of them are also rare and endangered. So practically in the middle of the city, we can find species that are on the verge of extinction or no longer exist elsewhere in Europe. According to currently known data, as many as 49 plants, 41 bird, 12 amphibian, three reptile and three crustacean endangered species live in this landscape park. So um, we, have quite a, um, we have to have quite a strong commitment to preserve this biodiversity, not, not just uh, because, let's say, the European policy now um, kind of demands the, this top down, but um, we also own it to our succeeders. Um, if we look at the aerial uh, photo of this forest, we can see, you can see all these sketches all over this um, slide. I won't go into details, but is, these are all the special zones that dictate different regimes of forestry measures uh, that is adapted to ecological demands of uh, population of those species. And uh, a couple of them, for example, this one, can you see the mouse moving? In the slide? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, so this one, this one, this one, and this one, here forest management uh, measures such as cutting is not allowed at all in the urban forest. That is visited yearly, this is data from 2009, so I guess the number should be higher right now, about by about 2 million visitors per year. Uh, I will just uh, say the number again uh, in the 459 hectares big of an area. But such as uh, I started, this is an important part also of the human habitat. So we are also important species that use this place for our health, well-being, uh, education and things as Teresa already mentioned why peri-urban parks are important for the citizens. Uh, so it's important part of the management. And uh, if let's say some nature conservation me measures want to be, um, uh, let's say put in, into force for the past, let's say 40 years, but more intensely past eight years, we have a generational perception of this area since 19th century, why this is this park is used and this forest is used. So we have quite a long way to go to to accept this, to 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 put it into ourselves. I don't know the English expression, but to internalize it, kind of. Um, and 
also because of this and also to let's say uh, more efficiently find a solution how to talk terms uh, uh, with dying and dead trees it would be really beneficial if people would stick to let's say official trails which you see on the left uh, because even if then you say you leave the dead and dying trees further than 30 meters away from the trails, you can still preserve quite a lot of areas with larger amount of dead and dying wood, for example. But reality is different. People are, of course, creating social trails uh, or unofficial trails, uh, whatever you like to call them, uh, that practically poses uh, not danger just to themselves, the people, if we uh, want to preserve dead and dying trees, but we as, as users of this park also introduce, for example, uh, invasive species in this forest. Uh, we, uh, we scare animals that live there. Uh, we make quite an impact also on the, the loss of the forest soil. I did the calculation and due to informant trails, we use two percent of of the forest um, of the forest uh, soil, not the soil, the floor, let's say, the area. And I think this is quite an uh, an impressive number. And um, on the other hand, or not on the other hand, but uh, let's say simultaneously, uh, we are more and more under the impression or the practice that is coming to us from the, the West, where uh, safety uh, is starting to dictate some of the measures. Gladly not too much yet, but um, I'm really a bit uh, anxious about uh, coming years um, uh, in which way the situation will go because uh, I really wouldn't like um, safety to be the first um, or the only, uh, let's say, uh, um, uh, decision-making uh, um, um, point, let's say, excuse me for my English, um, to, to, uh, to dictate this. But in some cases, maybe it has to be. For example, in this lower part, it's about seven hectares uh, of the area. We had probably the most remarkable beach forest for decades. Uh, and it was eternalized by the users of the park also. But it was a beach forest, you know, magnificent big trees with large diameters. Uh, some of them were dying, also had these cones of, um, of, of fungi uh, there. Uh, they were also, there was also a habitat, I mean, we found there more than 20 protected species, for example, in this area. But if you see, in this area is the largest density of official trails in the park. More than 300 meters per hectare. Where, whereas, let's say, in other parts of the park uh, that includes this, it's less than 40, for example. Uh, and here, um, let's say in this, this is the water reservoir, uh, where, for example, if a beech tree fell on that, it would break the, the wall of, of uh, this reservoir uh, for drinking water. And uh, of course, decisions were hard. Um, and uh, but forest was was already um, rejuvenated. Let's say there was a lot of seedlings and saplings and so on uh, already young forest growing beneath these beech trees. And um, the cut uh, was um, let's say on the way. And of course, it raised uh, quite a lot of dispute um, in public, either by uh, non-governmental organization, uh, individuals, uh, but also um, different uh, experts from different fields. Um, and I wouldn't go into details right now. We could uh, spare this uh, for the debate. 
But what I would also like to um, mention is the importance of public perception of not just dead and dying trees, but uh, dead, uh, dead um, uh, woody coarse debris, let's say, uh, dead biomass uh, of the woods. Um, and also in this area, uh, we managed to preserve some, um, let's say, lying dead wood and also some trunks of the trees that were cut along the way. But I must say that um, not all the visitors or, um, let's say, experts from these different fields uh, were keen on such solutions that is, that is absolutely important for preserving biodiversity because they say it's um, kind of a ruin, ruining the aesthetics of the park forest. And uh, one comment was also that it reminds people of death of trees that they liked. And this diminishes their uh, recreational experience. So um, being Ljubljana, uh, we are really, um, let, let's say, open floor for this debate. And I think this peri-urban park is a really excellent, um, um, let's say, a place for the round table to discuss um, maybe um, uh, up-to-date role of uh, this forest that we have uh, in the city. Uh, because only in this way we, we are able uh, not to see those slides separately, so biodiversity and humans, but uh, like for centuries, we can all use this park. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andre, for, for your presentation. Uh, yes, we will leave some of the interesting comments you were mentioning at the end for, for, for the discussion. Really, I was I was surprised with, by some of them because my thinking would be just the opposite. Uh, but I wanted just to ask some 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 question of what you said. Uh, you said that there was a large part of the park that was not managed at all. Why is this, why is that? How 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 come? Why? Yeah, it's because yeah. they are, uh, yeah, I'm not muted. Uh, because, um, let me just, I can put on uh, the picture, but it doesn't matter. Um, uh, it was decided uh, like this to protect the biodiversity. That's that's the, the main reason. Uh, two of, of, of these areas that are all together, let's say 12 hectares uh, of forest are so-called transition, tra transitional mires. It's a boggy place where, and one of them is also a so-called natural value of national importance uh, because some uh, quite a lot of endangered, mainly plant species live there. And it was protected uh, as such um, by the city. And uh, the other two uh, that are, we call it like an eco cell or something like that, uh, are just uh, left there as a forestry measure. So not nature protection measure, but forestry measure, but it is for to in, improve the, the biodiversity. Uh, in that eco cells, we don't have any conif coniferous trees, for example, a spruce. So we don't have problems with bark beetles, but um, Actually, we, we don't know what the future brings. I didn't show the pictures, for example, of the latest uh, wind throw that was here in March, uh, because a lot of this forest uh, has been planted by spruce. Uh, and these spruce trees are now really big and tall, uh, but they grow on uh, soil that doesn't have a good bedrock. Uh, the roots cannot uh, cling on to rock, for example, and they are really prone to wind throw. And of course, when you have down trees, um, the uh, outburst of, uh, let's say, bark beetles can happen quite quickly. But bark beetles are only one of the, um, let's say, organisms that could impact uh, or, um, this forest. But a lot of new pathogens are ca coming, uh, also invasive ones. And, um, 
we will see how non-management in this part of the forests impacts uh, not just the, um, um, the intention uh, why this park was protected. So let's say protection goals, uh, but also other functions that this park still has. Because yes, now it is a nature protected area, but it's still, uh, let's say, the biggest and the most visited uh, public green space in Ljubljana. Yeah, for me, for me, it's interesting, and this is a very philosophical question, and we can discuss it later. The affirmation that you say that if you want to preserve or there uh, was something to conservation, you don't need to manage. I mean, just that, this that, part. That, that, yeah, 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 yeah. No, because, interesting. Yeah. I mean, and, and I know this is something that uh, yeah, it is one of the way to do it. No, you just leave the ecosystem alone and see how it evolves. But to affirm it like that, I mean. You know, we have a lot of parts, all that, all that manage for, for, for one reason, eh? to protect biodiversity, because we also need to manage other things. So, no, inter interesting point. I was also wondering, um, in, in, in Slovenia, in Ljubljana, what are, how is climate change affecting the forest? What, what are the main uh, th threats that you are suffering? For example, for example, if I just uh, turn your attention to the um the forest that I mentioned in the end of presentation, for example, that beech forest, uh, it's been kind of suggested by the researchers that climate change um, uh, fast forwarded the, 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 the vitality uh, of, of these trees. Uh, and uh, especially this uh, extreme drought and a different kind of um, uh, precipitation regimes uh, weakened these uh, beech trees that were actually not that old if they would be living let's say somewhere away from the city you know all these beech trees had a lot of names from centuries carved in by knives and uh, car uh, hearts written there and also trails uh, were built there so they were all the time exposed to um, quite extreme um, impacts and they were uh, assessed to be about 140 uh, 145 years old and um suggested is or was that uh, the climate change uh, just like i said fast forward uh, the um, immune system of these beech trees uh, so um, different kind of uh, pathogens and other impacts um, kind of lowered its vitality. For example, in 2019, uh, there was a, a health assessment of, of this part of the forest done by the researchers. And it was said that the foliation of these beech trees was between 60 and 95%, uh, where uh, if it's above 30, if, if I remember correctly, um, the tree is evaluated as um, sick or non-vital, and this was between 60 and 70. Um, so yes, this is one thing. And the other thing is, like I said, uh, this coniferous part of the forest. And um, uh, with this, this extreme weather events, when extreme, uh, especially wind bursts, uh, just um, increases the gaps that uh, are already established in the forest you know by this and they just go on and on and on and it will change and it will change the the um uh, this forest uh, in the next decades definitely okay thanks i have some questions from the chat so uh, maybe uh, excuse me maybe just yeah. one information for yeah. the public this forest is not owned by the city this forest has more than 420 different owners, private owners. Yeah. The city the city owns only about well, a little more than 30% of this forest, I think. Yeah. Yeah. This complicates sometimes management, I know. So one, one uh, Martin Lord from the Lake District National Park is asking, do you have large affected by feet, by feet of Tora Ramorum? And what would be the response if that was ever found. 
Fit of Torara Morum. Do you know what is this? Um, I know. I, I've heard of Fit of Toras basically okay. because of these beech trees. Mm. I cannot uh, talk about large. Did he say large trees? Yeah. Large like, um, 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 yeah, okay. But uh, these beech trees were affected by Fit of Torah. I can show you just one picture again. Uh, let me just show you. What does that mean? Can you see the picture? Yes. Okay. Uh, this uh, tree that, um, I mean, this root belonged to a tree that uh, was just slightly hit on one branch when cutting another tree down and it just fell. And you can see how much roots was left from this beech tree. So this tall beech tree was standing only, okay, some roots were torn, but still, it offered a, uh, like I was explained, I'm not expert in this field, I must say. So if I'm saying something incorrectly, I kindly ask uh, someone from the audience to correct me. But uh, one of the reasons is also because Phytophthora could, let's say, eat up the roots and then goes uh, up to the trunk. This is what I can say about this, uh, but it's not my field of expertise. Okay, thank, you. thank you. More questions from Tajana Banturik from, from Zagreb. She's saying, how do you explain uh, to the people of the non-management? I mean, there is a are not managed. How do you explain to them this? Um, actually, uh, uh, um, if I may, I would, I would like to turn this question around. We don't have that much problem with explaining no management. Um, well, I'm lying now. I, I'm just, uh, I wanted to say something different, but yes, this non-management is, is a problematic, especially when people are complaining about dead wood lying around lying around in the forest you know it's like it's supposed to be but but for uh i would say the most complaints come because of um forest not not being tidy uh that's that's uh, the biggest problem but otherwise these uh, areas that are uh, taken out of the management are not uh close to official trails so uh, my comment is now uh, more on the uh, that would uh, seen, let's say, from the public trails. But uh, I think we will, we have, and we will have more problems. I mean, the foresters will have. This is the task for the Slovenia Public Forest Service um, to explain why management is necessary in such foresters, in such forest, and how does it differ uh, from managing let's say forests that are uh, mainly for wood production because here uh, especially let's say for the for one third of the forest uh, that is owned by the city uh, wood production is it doesn't matter it's all for the ecological and social functions and of course taking care of the safety of safety of the users okay uh, we'll take some couple of questions and then we will move to to pablo uh, do you have ash affected by deer bug? Yeah, and, yes. and if you so, uh, and in, in this event, uh, what do you do to monitor and manage these trees? Do you leave them uh, those that are far away of the tray, the paths, or what do you do? Uh, um... Not intentionally. Um, I don't have the exact data on this because, like I said, maybe I didn't. Yeah, I didn't say this. Uh, we, as a um, manager of the park, uh, according to uh, nature conservation legislation, we are not the owner of any part of the forest, neither a manager of the forest. So, but we are communicating with the owners and uh, we are observing what is happening. So, usually, if the the ash dies. Uh, it's usually cut, uh, but uh, I know for quite a lot of cases that uh, dead ash trees were left there for many years, for example. Okay, 
So last question uh, from Jeroen Grononjik. He's wondering if you do communication with the with the stakeholders when the, when your probably these private owners and how are they involved in this process of ma um, um, making decisions? Um, well, in Slovenia, uh, Slovenia Forest Service, so Public Forest Service, that is a national organization, mm -hmm. is rep responsible for making forest management plans. Mm -hmm. And everyone uh, can participate in this process. Um, in the end, when it's the decision to, uh, let's say, um, I will be just brutal, so which tree to cut, it's just the um, communication between the forester from the Slovenia Public Forest Service and the owner. But we as the manager for nature conservation of this um, park, we absolutely communicate with the owners. We also have a representative of private owners in um, our um, um, committee, park committee. Uh, and uh, But for the communication with the general public, we have a website and also Facebook page uh, where we uh, communicate all the activities in advance. But I must say and admit that we are very weak on integrating public into management. Uh, we are not uh, that uh, strong with uh, people, with employees to, to have this uh, possibility yet, but we would like to um, offer more opportunities to, uh, let's say, interested public to be more integrated in the management of the park. I'm not talking about the forest. That's the, I hope you and uh, you und understood the difference. Of what is our role and what is the forester's role? Okay, really, really thank you very much, Andre, for your excellent presentation. Still some questions, but we will have time uh, in the, the debate. Uh, now I uh, would like to give the floor to to Pablo Navasquiz, who is going to present a very interesting case, Mediterranean forest. You know even more subject to, to climate change. So please, Pablo, uh, the floor is yours. You are muted, Pablo, you need to unmute the mic. Good morning. Can you hear me well? Yes. First of all, thank you very much to Europark for organizing this, this webinar. I think it is a, a, a problem or a, or a task we have to approach from different, in different areas. So I'm going to also explain some of the cases in, in the, our natural park in Colcerola, the surroundings of Barcelona. Here in the picture, you have a, 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 a real case. Um, up, if you see the, the mouse, this is our office. This, the information center of the natural park. And at the base of this picture is the train station. Between these two uh, buildings, the, I mean, the, the train station the, and the, our information center, we had an area of about two and a half or three hectares of many large trees. And we had to take a decision whether to cut them or not. So I'll, I'll explain a little bit this case. First of all, a bit of context. The natural park of Colcerola is another scale as the previous par park uh, explained by Andre. It's about uh, 2,300 hectares in the middle of a huge uh, metropolitan area. This is the city of Barcelona to the southeast and surrounded by big infrastructures, highways, train stations, and large towns of about 50 to 100,000, each one of these. Uh, that's basically a natural park uh, in the middle of uh, over 3 million, 3.5 million people. A bit of context also, historical context here, you see the, the slopes facing the city uh, about 80 or 100 years ago, which were 
bear and we which were afforested in in the 1920s and 40s of the past century sometimes in the 60s even this is a picture of one town in the on on the up upside in, in the of the natural park and this is what we encounter now over the past two years i cannot talk about mediterranean landscapes and natural forests without addressing the climate change and forest fire risk of course in the center this is our natural park and as we see in this slide uh, according to to some uh, science uh, research that has been done it's uh, these these metropolitan parks are most prone to uh, climate change in, within the next uh, 50 years. So we see that these areas are very, very affected by drought. I will not get very much into the historical context, but maybe a few words about the, the existence of this natural park, which was created uh, in the 19, in the late 80s due to, to, to stop basically a, a, a very fast growing urban sprawl and which was conserved with management and conservation plans from the late 80s and then 90s with a, the, the declaration in 2010 and 2010 as a natural park. Um, it is important to underline too that 60 percent of the of the forest is private, 40 percent is public, basically uh, owned by the municipalities, but managed by the uh, natural park itself. That means by us. Um, in the early plans of the 1980s, the first management plan, literally it said that no forest management was allowed in public land. No, that was basically the, the, the vision, the, the, the goal of management plans in natural parks in the 80s and 90s. So this is not a recent thing. The abandonment of forest management over the past 50 years is very common in many European countries and even more so in the Mediterranean areas. We are we mostly have Aleppo pine, Pinus alepensis, and home oak, the Carcus ilex. And what we find over the past 20 years is a progressive mortality of pines due to winds, droughts. And of course, the forest fire risk that we have every year, small ones in our natural park, but it's a, a frequent uh, and growing risk. No? Um, we have a lack of forest planning, which is actually uh, uh, something that has to be done by the owner or the manager of each uh, forest. And our management uh, regarding prevention is basically linear. That means it addresses mainly the wildland urban interface uh, and electric power lines. No, I will skip this one. Well, this is a picture I like to take because it more or less represents the view of the park in the 1980s and 90s. No, we have a, here an old tree that was wanted to be protected. Um, a mm, bit of money, I would say so, was invested in the middle of the forest to. Um, to stop, um, to protect it from falling down. Um, this is an iron beam. This, and, and funny enough, this iron beam had to be relocated again because forest fire prevention um, trucks could not go underneath it, so it had to be changed again. So this also shows what happens, well, after a few years in the, in, in the scale of a tree, not very long, but this is a very recent picture. This is what we have now. Um, now the tree and the beam have to be removed. Also, climate tendencies very quickly. I mean, temperature, as we all know, is surely and steady growing. And precipitation, rainfall, well, it has very strong annual differences. Over the past three years, here we're missing 2023. But over the past three years, we've had an annual rainfall of half of the average over, over the past 50 years. 
during three years, this has caused a huge um, number of mortality in, in the tree, tree scenarios. So what we did in two different areas where we have an extreme drought and a large number of pine trees that have been affected by drought is a, a risk assessment, including drone analysis. This is an example of an area uh, southwest of the park with very dense uh, uh, paths and, and forest roads and number of people. One of the characteristics in this 8,000 hectares is that they have, of course, the, the affection of and the density of forest uh, paths is higher the closer you get to the cities, no? So we concentrate most of our, our uh, silviculture management in this area. Um, we're talking mainly about old, relatively old and relatively big trees, especially if you compare them to central European beaches or, or oaks, mostly Pinus pinea, stone pine, also Aleppo pine, as I said, and some things that have to be taken into account are the costs, the availability of a budget, the appearance of secondary pests, and the high media impact. So a decision has to be taken whether to cut or not, no? This is one of the examples I, I showed in the previous picture, an area closing the city of Barcelona of about seven hectares. This is Google map view from a few years ago. This is the, the picture uh, we seen recently, uh, like uh, six months ago. This is another area which is a very highly, uh, also next to the city, highly affected by, by death of pines. And also we could call it uh, the ramblas of the of, of the natural park of Cozerola with a very large number of people. And some people, somebody asked about communication and social uh, media uh, plans that we have to do. Well, this is very important in order to explain what has to be done or what can be done, what uh, consequences, action has to be taken if tea trees have to be cut. No? Here we have uh, local, uh, we had local TV, newspapers, radio inter interviews with um, our members from the natural park and also meetings with the local communities and officers, the municipal park services and neighborhoods in order to explain why we had taken the decision to cut these trees. This is the train station and this is the path that goes up to our information center, the offices of the natural park. Here are just some examples of more communication that has been done with the local TVs and uh, local media. This is a highly frequented area by people where during and before, before the, the trees had been felled, and here is some of the consequences with a highly, with a high uh, uh, media impact, the, the appearance of pests or plagues in some of these um, uh, forests affected by drought, but, and then by Tomicus destruens, which I would say, which we, we consider that they are not the cause of the, of the death of these trees. These are, it's, it's just another symptom of, of the, sanitary state of these trees. But it can become a plague when um, not a, a, a specific felling is taken into place because they can expand and attack more, uh, more, healthy, more healthy trees. To be taken into account in the difficulty of cutting down trees in difficult areas, next to train stations and tram stations and tables of uh, telephone phone lines and electric power. 
even not not just normal forestry works, but it's uh, sometimes more similar to gardening works, which increases the expense very much. And this is just one of the impacts right next to the cities where most of the pine trees, these are all stone pines that have been cut down. And fortunately enough, here we have an understory of home oak or olive trees and other shrub species that at least allow us to keep a, a, a vegetation to protect the soil in some areas that are very prone to be eroded by rainfall. And what we you what we try to to do as a not only as 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 a measure to protect erosion of the steep slopes is to use the wood and to explain that this wood that is used it just comes from the area that has been cut down and uh, well some some um, embankment protection and uh, from the raw wood stems that have been cut down in this area. More examples of um, the, the use of the wood, the trees that have been cut down to protect the soil from erosion. And some banks that have been also done with these trees. The, another question that has been addressed is the importance of leaving dead trees. I mean, there's no question about that. Uh, dead trees are very important, whether they stand or they or they are on the ground. So what we basically do is is a risk assessment. It's uh, uh, the question the question in certain areas where infrastructures and schools and paths are around. Well, I, we think that priority number one in these areas is safety. Uh, so we have to that take as a, as a priority number one. That's a small number of the trees that have been affected by drought and die, are dead. But and in some cases, well, uh, trees as the picture that has that Andre has shown before of that dead oak. Well, here we have the same with a dead um, pine stone pine tree. Of course, the cost of of, of chopping off the, the canopy of these trees is extremely expensive, but uh, the ecological uh, in, importance of this is also uh, to take into account. No? Well, more challenges uh, that we are going to, to find within the next years we think it's going to be an increasing increasing tendency, especially in the Mediterranean woodlands landscape, and the specific the species uh, of our land, of our forests are changing. That means uh, many of our pines are dying, and there are there's very scarce or little regeneration of the pine trees. Um, this has been substituted where rainfall allows it by uh, home oaks. The, in case of cutting down trees, the explanations in, in highly dense uh, areas with a lot of people and users and hikers and associations and neighbors uh, has to be very intense because the social media impact is large also we cannot uh, underestimate many people complain or go to the police or even try to stop uh, wor works and forestry works that are that are taken in because well they don't think that people have to cut down we, we have to cut down certain trees we cannot as a public administrator talk about felling and managing without talking about money and uh, budget uh, issues are very important. This is, well, I suppose it's our common a co common problem in most of places. No? Uh, where does the money come from? Because, well, maybe some countries 
or in some administrations, uh, the the managers have a certain number of of uh, amount of budget in case of an emergency. Well, we have to find ways to to address these issues in case of emergency. Say, I mean, it could be dead drying trees, or it could be a wind, uh, or it could be a forest fire. And of course, the civil liability. Um, uh, this is an, an, a delicate issue, but it's uh, never clear. And if it comes to worse, it can end up in the hands of a judge in case a tree falls down and injures or even kills people and what consequences that has. Um, we see that every now and then in, in city parks, for example, but it can also, I'm surely all, some happened in forests and how the ownership is liable in a civil way or even in a in a criminal way. I've also read news about um, forest or park managers that have been criminally sued because of because um, a tree or a branch has injured or killed somebody. So these are just things and issues that have been that have to be taken into account when when we make a decision about uh, cutting or not cutting down a tree. And I am finished because I wanted, would like to, to receive questions or comments about, um, about these, these matters. Just another, another slide. This is the area where we, where we cut down over 200 trees in, in six hectares next to the city of Barcelona, no, but right next to the, the city is right here in the southwest. And this is the picture after the cutting. And what we see is that after the felling of these trees is more or less before the felling, because we still have, or we have again, a large number of trees with defoliation, and um, well, we didn't want to cut down all trees that were dying. We left some, but we know that most of these trees that were dying and were with a very strong defoliation a year ago are now dead. So we will probably have to go in again just a year after the last intervention. Well, thank you very much. I'm open to your thank comments. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Pablo. Uh, very, very complete uh, um, presentation. In fact, you have already uh, uh, answered, at least partially, some of the questions that were posed to you. Uh, one of them was about the context, uh, the, the position that uh, the local communities or some people uh, might have uh, against this uh, cutting down of trees. So, but do you have any good recommendation about good communication, what what can we tell these people so that they are not so much against? Well, normally, I think the the best the best way that society has to understand why why managing a forest, because I would like to say more manage a forest is necessary, is normally, unfortunately, after a disaster happens, after a natural disaster happens. Yeah. So this we have seen very strongly in the not in a, after a forest fire which would be typically in the Mediterranean context but we have seen this uh, 15 years ago in 2009 with the strong winds that uh, blew away or, or felled uh, broke and uh, thousands of trees in 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 this natural parks and in all of the metropolitan region uh, affecting many many houses and infrastructures and Forces and people started to realize that having big trees near homes and near infrastructures can be also dangerous. So that was a big moment that uh, people, re when people realized and society noticed that something has to be done. Living, especially when you live near or within inside forested areas. So uh, on the other hand. Um, uh, well, first of all, we have to deal with the fact that forest management might be criticized, but we have to have we have to explain it beforehand before acting. 
if possible, huh? in well, in local communities and their websites, uh, local newspapers, etc. Okay, so you also partially uh, answered that there was a question about liability, um, responsibility of the park itself or, 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 or um, landowners about these trees. I mean, what happened? I mean, are they really responsible if it's a natural park? Come on, it's not a urban garden. Can we blame them? Well, I mean, there's, uh, that's more a, 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 it's more a judge that has to decide that. No, I mean, um, it's difficult. There is no, there is no absolute answer to to this. No, I mean, um, if but the fact is that uh, I showed you a slide that with the news before. Um, uh, the city of Barcelona was sued because a tree in a park fell in the after wind. It was a palm tree, and the city had to pay the victim yeah, uh, hundred thousand euros. And but it has also an ecological consequence because the city park decided that every palm tree that had was bigger or taller than eight meters had to be felled down. So th these are the the other aspects of of not only the the legal aspects that has to be taken the suits the lawsuits. That, that that judge has to finally decide, but also what impact, what ecological and technical impact that that has on 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 decision making. But that was a urban park. I, I see different. It was a urban from, from, from a urban park, a natural park. It's it's, it's a, but I mean, it's, it's for me, it's different. But okay, I mean, yeah, big discussion here. Uh, more questions. So uh, how come that the, the forest is no so balanced so that it, they, it needs to be rejuvenated? Why is, is it so? Why is there no regeneration of pines in Considola? Is that the question? Yes, well, well I, I think in general, I think also, also happens in the Slovenian uh, case uh, presented that because like, and, like a lack of management, perhaps, or whatever. There's there's uh, no uh, healthy community of trees. I mean, we ju juvenize uh, young and adults. It's, uh, and this causes the problems. Might cause problems now. Well, there are probably there are surely many many answers uh, to mm -hmm. why there is no regeneration. I mean. Uh, of Aleppo pine, for example, this is the most frequent species in in Colcerola. The, the Aleppo pine is a colonizing uh, uh, species. It normally needs open space, open spaces, and that means either a very large disturbance or very intensive forest management. So that has to do to both first lack of forest management. A very dense understory of uh, shrublands and home oak uh, structure in most areas, and um, recent recent studies are are showing that um, also the of course in in under climate change situation with high temperatures and irregular precipitation the regeneration, the seedlings of certain species have more difficulties to survive their, their first years uh, under these circumstances. Okay. Um, is there any kind of treatment that we could do to trees in order to prevent dying? I mean, especially if it's, of course, it's lack of water, but also because this lack of water, there are more uh, immune... Uh, um, affected, as uh, Andre was uh, saying, no, they are not so vital, and then they are prone to have diseases. Can we do some pre treatment? Would be justified? Well, first of all, uh, explain that it also to larger audiences and the social society. Trees are are living beings, and they they also have a right to die, and and then once they reach a certain age. Um, our our pine species die uh, at the age of say uh, 80 100 and under certain cir circumstances maybe they can live 120 years so many of these trees have reached also their biological uh, age so it is it, it is normal for trees to die 
uh, we are we it is part of the ecosystem that people that for a regeneration we need trees to die that's first first of all second in the mediterranean context we have to reduce uh, competition uh water is is, is scarce and uh, the de the density of many areas of many trees and woodlands are are is very high so forest management if we want to promote certain species we will have to uh, reduce the density with thinning uh, in in many of these forests so thinning of trees and of of a thinning of of uh, home oaks and the reduction in certain areas where forest fire is risk is high also of understories uh, density where erica where our ericas are very very inflammable and many times dead so this is what has to be and what is done in certain areas yes yeah but and here and I'm linking it with the presentation from Andre yeah, and again to again pose this difficult question so you are suggesting to manage to really manage so whereas uh, in Andre case there was some places that the decision was really not to manage so to leave the ecosystem by itself I would so, like to say that what? even not managing is also a decision, and okay. um, mm -hmm. that, that means it, it is a, it, it, it is it is due to a plan. And of course, I talked about the two examples where the decision was taken to cut down due to safety reasons, basically. But I also would like to remember that most of the trees that are died or dying are not cut down; they are left in in the forests where they do not represent a a risk to to people basically or infrastructures yeah but you were just Anybody, saying yeah. andre wants to address or specify yeah. something else more yes but you were saying that, that perhaps we need to thin the forest so that there are not so much competition between trees so that they are uh, healthy so even yes if, and, and i understand that this means to cut down Yes. Trees that are not dying, not old, but just for the sake of, you know, have a healthier forest, sometimes it is needed. Yeah? Correct. Correct. Yes. Okay. Now, Andre, what do you think about that? Would you agree? Uh, thank you, Pablo, for a very interesting uh, presentation and also um, your replies uh, afterwards. Um, I was nodding all the time because I would actually, I could talk the same. It was very interesting that you said that about the tendencies in 80s and 90s about um, stopping managing the forest. It happened also here. And it was also one of the reasons uh, why it came to such a situation. Um, and maybe I didn't address more uh, my first slide where I, or the second slide where I was talking about the foresters from 19th century and 20th century, they were all uh, complaining about problems of rejuvenation. So having uh, young trees surviving, but they were mainly blaming at that time overuse of the forest by citizens, you know, the trampling this. Um, but also now we have a problem because people don't, I don't know how is it uh, in, uh, in Barcelona, but... Uh, People don't perceive young patches uh, of patches of young forest. So let's say trees up to 50 centimeters or four four meters, let's say, as a forest. They say this is a shrub. This is not a forest. We want to have big trees, but you can't have big trees forever. I mean, at the same time. Um, so it's. Uh, uh, but I mean. I, I said it in in, in uh, our case, you could have it, but you really have to have this micromanagement, which like uh, Pablo said, is extremely expensive and it's not necessarily the best for all the species that you want to protect, not just the tree species, but also the organisms that depend on those species. So whatever you do, you are changing the situation. Uh, either you do it or nature do it, or you do it together. I, I think it's still the most important to have the forest, uh, to have a vital forest, and um, 
urban forests or uh, forests in urban parks, in peri-urban parks, uh, due to their role as also recreational areas, I, I don't see any other way but to manage them. Uh, because otherwise um, we would have, I don't know how many generations um, that could have, um, that could not have, uh, let's say, such an opportunities to uh, use this for their daily needs and so on. I mean, yeah, and just to, to finalize because uh, time is is running, uh, we we can come. Uh, the, the this idea that you you express at uh, the very beginning uh, uh, in your talk, uh, Andre, about people being against or having these dead trees because, as Pablo was saying, they are not considered a part of the life cycle. They, they you only wanted to have them in their imagination as they were young. For me personally, I found dead trees so beautiful and, and nice to 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 take a picture of them. I, it's what I do when I see them. For me, that they're beautiful. So I don't understand this this thinking, and I'm really surprised. Why is it so? Um, it's... I could just speculate, yeah. but yeah. In, in my experience, uh, it's mainly due to the the lack of knowledge and awareness of their importance. Because usually, if if um, you kind of know what the role of some element in your environment has. Uh, if you know it, then you could also appreciate it better. I, I mean, this is my experience. Um, and But the other thing is also, uh, let's say, even before Second World War uh, and uh, in that time, or even before, much before, um, People, uh, the citizens were, for example, allowed by the city in the city owned forest to gather um, branches and parts of, uh, uh, of trees that were lying on the ground, let's say for the heat in, in, their, um, in their homes. So they, uh, if they see such a part of a tree, uh, a wood lying on the floor, it impacts their perception. Uh, let's say my grandmother is like that. She, she would pick everything up uh, <laughs> and um, has this perception that you should tidy this because you can use this. You know, it was poverty back then. And mm. uh, so um, this will have to take some time and also efforts in education, such as also this webinar, for example. So thank you, Europa, for this opportunity to um, really raise the importance of the, um, not just dying and dead trees, but also the um, that biomass uh, that's left uh, uh, in the forest. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Andre, Paolo, for this webinar. I think this is a topic that the Peru Ramparts Commission, we will uh, still work on it. It's re really, really interesting. Uh, we will get to put in the chat a link to a survey uh, that we would like participants to just answer. It's very, 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 very quick uh, survey so that uh, to have an idea uh, how we can improve this kind of webinars. I really hope that everyone has enjoyed it as much as I have done. And uh, just uh, we'll um, say to you to have a nice summer under the shade of a tree. Hey, excuse me, <laughs> Teresa. Yeah. Just one, just one thing. Um, I think some people in the chat might have had some questions. Um, I probably have not been able to answer or address all of them, but I would appreciate if Europark could uh, yes. uh, address my email and send it to anybody that has any yeah, specific yeah. questions it's I can. Of course, of course we'll do it. Me. Yeah, 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 yeah. We will have all the yeah, yeah. Sorry that uh, we were not able to neither to open mics nor to answer all the questions in the chat. Uh, but of course we will um, um forward uh, to to both uh, Andre and Pablo, and we will collect all the answers and 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 send them to the participants together with the uh, recording of the webinar and and the presentations. Thank you very much, and. Have a nice uh, day. Bye-bye.